You've never hit anyone yet. Just stand still, Bud Light. That's enough. You, you've proved you can do it. I got to draw a picture of the famous Ned Buntline, who wrote all them storybooks about Western heroes. But you don't have to aim so close. Well, I got to draw an accurate picture. Now, hold your head where it was. No, no, a little bit to the left. There. Now I can finish your head. You're going to finish me. Well, if you live, you can put it in a book. He expected Wyatt to cooperate with his fantastic ideas. But when Wyatt moved from Dodge City to Tombstone, he thought he had gotten rid of Buntline. Alas, alas. Well, Spencer, there you are, Tombstone, wickedest town in the West. Now, make a good sketch of it, because we'll put it on the cover of my new book. It's very uh, colorful, Mr. Buntline. Colorful? I'll sell 250,000 copies of the first edition. <laughs> oh, and wait until you meet my special friend, Marshal Wyatt Earp. Yes, sir. King of the Frontier, that's what I called him. And that book sold 500,000 copies, not counting the English rights. <laughs> Wyatt Earp, well, he's a gold mine. I'll bet he's still wearing that Buntline special coat I gave him. <laughs> I want to meet some real outlaws, Wyatt. My opposition is cleaning up with books on the on the James Boys and Sam Bass and Billy the Kid. Of course, it's the old Robin Hood legend brought up to date. But my readers, they, they want outlaws too. Some gallant band that takes from the rich and gives to the poor. That's the kind of... What's the matter? Well, Mr. Buntline, I've never met any outlaws like that. Well, what about the Clanton gang? No, Mr. Buntline. But you do know them, don't you, Wyatt? Oh, yeah, yeah I know them. Uh, we're in luck. He knows the Clantons. Now, Wyatt, all I want is an introduction. I'm sorry, Mr. Buntline, but if you'll take my advice, you won't go anywhere near them. But why? Because they're horse and cattle thieves, they rob stages, and they shoot men in the back. That's why. Uh, well, now, maybe you're a little prejudiced, Wyatt. I mean, being a peace officer. Mr. Buntline, it just doesn't do me any good to try and argue with you. Now, the Clantons are dangerous, low-down hoodlums. But if you want to glorify them in a book, well, then that's your business. But maybe circumstances drove them into crime. Maybe some deep personal tragedy embittered them. Mr. Buntline, please. Marshal Earp knows this country. If the Clantons are dangerous... Uh, all right. All right, Spencer. Maybe you're right. Maybe I had better take the Marshal's advice. Wyatt, how about having dinner with us down at the hotel? Be glad to. Miss Nelly Cashman has the finest food in town. Oh, it's real warming to see you again, my friend. Well, it's wonderful to see you too, Mr. Butler. You know, that gun you gave me is, well, it's kind of been my right arm all these many years. Good. Well, Mr. Spencer, I uh, want to thank you for backing me up. The Clantons are no people to monkey around with. I'll see you later. All right. This is just plain foolishness. Inviting a book writer to dinner and then coming all the way in after him. Emma, he wrote Dameron of the Nugget, and Dameron thinks we ought to treat him friendly. A man who's friends with Wyatt Earp. Politics, sis. We can show Buntline that we're hard-working, honest ranchers. And Dameron says that Buntline sells books all over the country. Well, that must be him now. Oh, Mr. Clinton? Mr. Buntline, Mr. Spencer, welcome to our city. Thank you. Mr. Spencer, you sit with me. my daughter, Emma Clinton, Mr. Spencer, Mr. Buntline. How do you do, Mr. Clinton? Get right in here, sir. Driver. <laughs> Howdy, Mr. Leslie. I thought you were in Denver. Where do you know me, Wyatt? A rolling stone? Yeah, I know you. He threatened to shoot a fellow over in the Cosmopolitan. 
Oh, my joke went sour, Wyatt. I uh, dropped a lizard down a man's neck, and he didn't laugh. The feller had to laugh or he'd get shot. So the feller told me. Well, I guess I got a little carried away. Yeah, I guess you did get a little carried away. Well, if you'd checked your gun, you wouldn't have had that trouble. I'm gonna have to hold you here for a while. Mr. Gibbs, you uh, put Mr. Leslie in a nice, clean cell all by himself. Would you like some coffee, Frank? Well, sure, Wyatt. Drop in for a chat later, huh? I sure will. Well, they call him Buckskin Frank. He's one of the fastest men with a gun I've ever seen. I want to keep real friendly. Oh, we're pals, Wyatt. Lead the way, friend. I don't know this jail. Well, rat right this way, friend. <laughs> you know I can't figure out for the life of me how Wyatt Earp got the idea that you people were uh, outside the law. Just politics, Buntline. Why, Earp's a northerner. We're southerners. Oh. oh, Papa, tell him about the Epitaph newspaper. Oh, yes, Finn. I clean forgot about that. Got a Jack Leg editor named Clum, the Epitaph has. Clum. And everything that the Nugget says, Clum says contrary. Oh, and there's no such thing, then, as the Clanton Gang. Clanton Gang? Well, never heard of it, did you, Finn? Just a lot of mean talk, that's all. Oh. You mean you people are blamed for what the real outlaws do? Why, yes, just politics, Buntline. Oh, daughter, uh, have, take a chair. Uh, Mr. Buntline wants his artist to draw our picture. What for? Well, to put in his new book. Now, don't be shy, my dear. Do I have to, Papa? It ain't a matter of having to, Emma. We aim to be friendly and show good manners. There you are, my dear. Thank you. Oh, Mr. Ike, will you sit right up close to your sister, please? Make a group of it. <clears throat> All right, Spencer, there you have them. The Clantons, en famille. Uh, that means all together. <laughs> there we are. Now, while he's drawing, could I make a few notes on the further misunderstandings? Just tell the truth, Buntline. That's all we ask. Well, that's exactly what you get, Mr. Clanton. And I want to thank you for your gracious hospitality. Yeah. Say goodbye to Miss Emma for us. Yeah. Oh, and tell her she's going to like that picture. We're going to put it right on the front cover. Fine. <laughs> now, you drive them into town, you drive real careful. Oh, yeah, thank you. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye. 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 I didn't believe those people. Leave them. I didn't either. Are you, uh, are you going to call them outlaws in the book? Well, of course I am. Naturally, I'll, I'll mix in a little of the Robin Hood and their activities, but don't you see the book? The Clampons posing as respectable ranchers and engaging in all kinds of lawlessness. I, I don't think they'll like that, Mr. Buntline. Yeah, but my readers will. Unless I'm very wrong, they're, uh, they're violent people, the Clantons. Well, of course they are. But you don't think they're going to come to New York to shoot me, do you? Well, I... Oh, now, Spencer, buck up. Did you ever hear of a writer getting shot for what he wrote or, or an artist for what he drew? And we're going to make liars out of those other writers because Ned Buntline actually visited the Clanton outlaws. <clears throat> It's a beautiful country around here, isn't it? <laughs> I did understand you, Wyatt. Here I am, a gambler and gunfighter, and... We always got along, though. How come? Well, for one thing, you never fight unless you have to. And, uh... Oh, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll come back when you're not busy. No, he's not busy, man. I'll just take my gun belt, Mosey. Hmm? My gun belt. Mr. Leslie. Thanks again, Wyatt. All yours, man. Well, what is it this time? Your friend, Mr. Buntline, wants to write a book about us. He does? Well, I've read a couple of his books, and they're just trash. Now, is that a nice way to talk about your guest? Well, he's not a guest any longer. He, he came back here this morning, he and that, that artist fellow. 
Mr. Earp, you've got to do something about it. He's going to say terrible things about us, and, and, and Papa will just kill him, that's all. Wait a minute. How do you know that Mr. Buntline is going to write anything about the Clantons at all? By the questions he asked. He pretended to believe Papa, but I know he didn't. He's going to say we're bad people. Oh, no. No, he's going to make you into heroes. What? Oh, sure. Sure, if Mr. Buntline ever writes anything about the Clantons, why, uh, well, he'll change your father into a Robin Hood. You'll be victims of circumstance who rob the rich and give to the poor. I don't believe you. Oh, that's what Mr. Buntline told me himself. You don't have to worry. I'll probably wind up the villain. I don't trust Mr. Buntline. And I don't want him to put us in a book. And you'd better warn him he can't hide, not even in New York. <laughs> One of the doggondest fool things that Buntline has ever done. Now, you and I know outlaws, Mr. Leslie. Have you ever heard of one of our hoodlums that robbed the rich to give to the poor? Nope. No, neither have I. Well, I can't stop him from putting nobility into his outlaws, but what do you reckon Clanton will do if Buntline ever publishes that book? Why, he'd kill the fool, serve him right, too. Well, I'd rather have him educated. Would how? Well, I wonder just what would happen if uh, Mr. Buntline was kidnapped by Buckskin Frank Leslie and his gang of lawless hoodlums. <laughs> oh, that sounds like fun, Wyatt. Well, give me the rest of the joke. Well, I want to just show them how ornery hoodlums can really be. That is, if you can get some boys to go along with it. Oh, yes, I think I can. <laughs> All right, on time, but keep him gagged. <laughs> Out your hand. Hey, boss. There's a big diamond in this ring. Mm. Look here. Hey, Benny. I want four of you on guard at all times. You see any Wells Fargo men or Pinkertons, you give me the word. We gotta get rid of him. Yeah, boss. And that means hiding the body before we lie it out. Now, you understand? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. You want that gag pulled tighter? Mm -hmm. now, you just sit down there. Count your money. <laughs> There's less than a thousand here. You wearing a money belt? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ow! <laughs> Dead one to bring in them bank sacks. All of them? Everything. Don't know why we bothered to bring you along. Except somebody told you my name, didn't they? Mm. Now, didn't they? Mm -hmm. Who am I? Buckskin Frank Clanton. What else they tell you? They didn't tell me. Out with it. They just said that you were old man Clanton's cousin. May I have a glass of water, please? When I get around to it. We whacking it up here, Frank? I ain't decided yet. This fat fool's less than a thousand on him. Can he identify you? He can. Worse luck for him. Oh, no, I, I can't identify you, Mr. Clanton. You were just pointed out to me on Allen Street, and, and I couldn't... Shut it! Nobody knows me as a Clanton. Yeah, he could tie in with the old man Clanton. Yeah, that cheap, low-down rustler, him and his rowdy boys. Better get it over with, Frank. You aim to bury him? Yeah, I might be safest. Tell Benny to start digging a grave. Yes, sir.
You apparently don't know who I am. You're a drummer, ain't you? My name is Ned Buntline. I'm the author of 56 novels. Storybooks? Like they sell on trains? And all over the world, sir. And furthermore, I am a close personal friend of Marshal Wyatt Earp. <laughs> you must be getting mighty careless about his friends. Well, if any harm comes to me, he'll hunt you down. Sure. Now, we yanked you right out of Tombstone. Now, where was Earp? Well, he's heard about it by now, I assure you. Hey, boss. Deadwood said you was gonna bury him first. What about it? There ain't no time. We ain't far enough away. And besides, we still gotta whack up all that bank money. You talk too much. But, boss! Now, turn around and walk out that door. No, I... No, boss. No. No, boss. No! Who? Oh. What? You shot him in the back. It's as good a place as any. Hey, Deadwood, come here. Benny! Look at here, Frank. Oh, 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 oh. no. Oh. No. No, I won't. You sit still. Sit tight. I'll be sending a committee of boys in to find out why I killed Benny and Deadwood. You must be mad. Yeah, like a fox. I thought there was honor among thieves. Honor? Why, there's over $40,000 in them bags. Now, when the boys come in, now you just keep your mouth shut, you understand? Murderer! We better push along, Wyatt. I got the jitters. I don't trust that buckskin, Frank. Mr. Gibbs, you just don't understand practical jokers. Mr. Leslie's having the time of his life. Yeah, but you told me that Bunline was right spunky. He just might get some of them fellers sore at him. Yeah. Come on. Now, there are two of us in here, Tex. And five out there. Now, ain't a two-way cut better than splitting it up seven ways? Yeah. But what about him? He'd be a witness. Well, I got plans for him. What plans? Well, see, now, he's a rich writing fella. We'll take him into Tucson and make him wire New York for $20,000. And if he don't, he won't give us no trouble, will you, Buntline? Will you promise not to kill those men outside? Well, now, why shouldn't we kill them? Well, you don't kill your own pals in cold blood. <laughs> well, now, where did you ever hear a thing like that? I reckon a fella's got to be that way, though, to write a book. Well, we better get at it, Tex. You're not... Now, you're you not... keep sitting right there. Murderers. Unbelievable fiends. I will not... You all done good. Benny did what you cashed in wonderful. That me a little play acting one time. <laughs> well, you scared me. I thought I left a real bullet amongst them blanks. Now, all but you, Tex. Uh, head back into town real quiet like. One more murder before we go back in, so don't rush it. You don't yell on the killer, Sam. On your knees. Better say your prayers for sure. Go ahead. Go ahead and shoot me. 
You want to die? Well, my death will bring Wyatt Earp and some brave peace officers after you. Get the bullets out of my saddlebag here and get the guns ready. You stand up against that wall. Strength, they're real bullets. Shut up. I know what I'm doing. How are things going? Well, all right so far, Marshal, but if I was you, I'd move in fast. Sometimes Leslie gets carried away with his joking. Thank you. Stand steady, your butt line. How do you expect me to draw your picture with you flinching and moving? Get it over with. There's plenty of time. Move your head a little bit to the left. There. I want the rest of Glance to know how Buckskin Frank drawed your picture with bullets. You're almost hitting, Frank. Ah. I draw my wife's picture like this time and time again. Did you murder her? No, she left me. She said it got on her nerves. Silly girl. You notice the spacing of them bullets? You see any wobble in that line? Give me that other gun. You're gonna murder me anyway. Do it with one shot. Spunky, cuz, ain't he? Yeah. I kinda hate to do this. Hold it. Wider! Put the gun on the table. You all right, Mr. Bunline? Oh, why, thank heaven you're here. He, he killed most of his men, and he was gonna kill me. He... Mr. Gibbs, you take those criminals outside, tie them up, and put them on a horse. We're gonna throw them in jail. Outside, Embers. Scum! Come. Come. Now, you come on over here and sit down, Mr. Puntline. You look a mite nervous. Oh, why? It was awful. It was just awful. Uh, well, you just relax there. <laughs> Mr. Gibbs, bring Mr. Puntline the bottle. Now, I want you to tell me exactly what happened. Oh, why? He, he broke every rule in the outlaw's code. Oh. The men he killed didn't have a chance. They didn't have a chance. Yeah. No. Well, when you're raised by Apaches, it's... Yeah. Uh, you see, they, they, they took all my things, and they, they took my money, and they were going to hold me for ransom. And if you hadn't come, I'd, I'd be dead. I'd just be dead. Here, thank you. Mr. Gibbs, here, now, you take some of this. Yeah, thanks very much. Just drink a little of that. You know. I would be dead. Mm -hmm. You sure not, you're not exaggerating? Wyatt, when a man comes as close to death as I was, he sees things very clearly. Mm -hmm. I remembered everything you said, but you only guessed at their fiendishness. Uh, really? Yes. <laughs> But soon, the world will know the truth. Huh. Wyatt, was he really raised by Apaches? Mescalero tribe, I think. Mescalero? How do you spell? Oh, never mind, never mind, never mind. I'll get it. Ringo's in town already. Why don't you gun him right away, Curly? He's the one who's sore. He'll have to come after me. You sure you want to fight Curly Burroughs just now? Yeah. What a break for Wyatt. Ringo and Brocious, top guns for the Clanton outfit, gunning for each other. You don't figure they'll really shoot it out, do you, Doc? Mr. Gibbs? Your naivete charms me. When two top gunfighters like Johnny and Curly have a fallen out, it's just a matter of waiting. And while I'm waiting, I aim to get some bets down. Uh, 
Who do you pick to win? It's a professional secret. You make your own bets. One of the mysteries of the Old West to amateur historians was how so many top gunfighters lived so long. The answer, as Wyatt Earp said, is simple. They seldom fought one another. When men of equal speed and skill got in a gunfight, it meant death to both. Thus, when Curly Brocious and John Ringo rode into Tombstone to settle a quarrel, it looked as if Wyatt would soon be rid of two enemies. Galloping horses on Allen Street's against the law. I gotta talk to you. I didn't want it, but Papa said I should. All right. Allow me. Now, uh, let me get this straight. Brocious and Ringo are in town, and they're threatening to shoot each other, and your papa thinks that I ought to stop the fight? Well, isn't that what your job is, to keep law and order? Yes. Yes, I'll have a talk with Johnny and Curly. Well, disarm them. Run them out of town. Oh, I can't do that. They've racked their guns, and they're behaving decent. You mean you can't stop this fight? Well, I can try and talk some sense into their head. By the way, you never told me what the fight was all about. Oh, oh, Brocious accidentally shot Ringo's horse. They, they were in a fight with some Mexican rustlers. And Ringo, he thinks that uh, Curly did it on purpose. Well, I guess, who knows what Ringo thinks? Anyway, you better stop this fight, or the Nugget newspaper will have you fired. <laughs> You wanted to see me, Dameron? Not as editor of that wretched little sheet you publish, but you're supposed to be acting mayor. This goes on page one unless Earp stops the fight. Deliberate slaughter on Allen Street. Is that what you call good police work? Hmm? Brocious, Ringo? I hadn't heard about this. You've heard about it now. Mr. Mayor. Well, now I'll tell you, Mr. Dameron. There hasn't been any shooting. Where did you get your tip off? From old man Clanton? Look, I don't reveal my news sources to you, Clum. Well, where's your sheriff, Johnny Bean? Why doesn't he stop this? Well, sheriff Bean was suddenly called away. Mm-hmm. I'll just bet he was. Nugget doesn't stoop to argue with a cheap little imitator. I want action from the city police. And that means up, immediate action. Well, now I'll tell you, Mr. Dameron. You got me shaking in my boots. Well, sir, you had better be. Good day. Man, Clanton's got a lot of gall bringing his quarrels into Tombstone. I think Ringo and Brocious are on their own. Gunfighters usually like audiences. Well, then let them shoot it out, White. I wish I could. Dameron does have a point. No, let him holler. No, sir. If it was just a quick brawl in the saloon and a shooting, I wouldn't be expected to do anything about it, but I have been warned about this. Townspeople expect me to do something. Yes, but... What? I'll have a talk with Ringo and Brocious. No. You stay out of it, Mr. Mayor. All right, White. White? Good luck. You see, Curly's at the Alhambra. Talking fight. Hello, Mr. Ringo. Well, if taint Marshal Earp. I hear you uh, aim to settle something with Curly. That's kind of foolish, isn't it? Foolish? John can take him. I don't think so. No, I think they'd both be dead. You want to bet? Shut up, Irish. They tell me that uh, Curly shot your horse by accident. My horse? My business. He offered to pay you for it, didn't he? Why don't you move along? Yeah. All right. I've got your last words. Now, I'd like a before-death statement from Curly. Was Herb trying to scare us? Shut up. <laughs> well, 
Here's to good old Johnny Ringo. We've been pals a long time. But not now, Curly. I still can't believe it. Getting sore of... Don't tell me. That ain't Wyatt Earp. Good old Johnny Law. Come on over, Wyatt. Larkin, give Wyatt your chair. Sure, Curly. Surprise me, Mr. Brushes. Why'd you let this go so far? Who, me? Yeah, you. You could have offered to pay for the horse. I didn't only offer to, I bought him another horse. Better than the one that got killed. Right, Larkin? Curly, give 200 for him. The proof is he's still riding it. And what more can a man do, Wyatt? Well, you could go on back to Clanton Ranch. Let Ringo cool off. He'd think I was scared. We don't run from nobody. Well, it seems to me that the least you boys could do is take your fight outside of town. Now, why don't you and Ringo just shoot it out on the trail? Johnny don't want it that way. He said if he caught Curly in Tombstone, he'd got him. You couldn't take that either, Wyatt. Man can't back down from a fight. We ain't scared of Ringo. All right. Tom will just have to dig two graves in Boot Hill. So long, Curly. Best bet I've seen in months. And you two men just sit there. Haven't you any imagination? Ringo versus Brocious. In a grudge fight with guns. Think of the amusing possibilities. All right, Doc, such as what? Even money, they kill each other. Or two to one that Ringo kills Brocious, and I'll take that bet the other way. I'll bet ten to one that Ringo dies and Brocious is only wounded, and I'll take that bet the other way also. All right, gentlemen, get up your money. Well, what odds do you give on him not fighting at all? Well, that's a very interesting thought. Very interesting. Doc. Right with you, Wyatt. Now, you two sportsmen, stay right here. Don't leave. Look, Doc, I'm in trouble. Just want to get this town cooled off somewhat. This breaks loose. Now, we can't afford a showdown between Ringo and Brocious. You're a fool. Thanks. Let them kill each other. Then the McLowry boys will be top guns for Clanton. You're thinking like a hoodlum. I am not. I'm thinking like a gambler. You mean you're making bets on this? Of course I am. I got some customers waiting inside. Look, I want you to do me a favor. You want me to kill them? No, I want you to talk them out of it. I respect your opinion. Me, I'm just a John Law trying to keep the peace. Am I a friend, Wyatt? Then I say as your friend, this is the best thing that's happened to you since you came to Tombstone. Johnny Ringo and Curly Broche is dead, and you don't even have to kill him. I'm wearing a star. I can't think the way you do, Doc. Nobody will blame you but Dameron of the Nugget, and he blames you for everything anyway. You know, you're a gambler. Why don't you uh, make bets that there won't be any fight, and then you stop it? You can get awful long odds that way. Sorry, Deacon. You love your enemies. I want them buried. Emma said you promised to talk to Ringo and Brocious. I did talk to him. No luck? Then throw him in jail. I don't want this fight to happen. Nothing to arrest him for, Mr. Clanton. They checked the guns. They've created no disturbance. Yet. Where's Johnny being? Well, he, uh, ducked out. Huh. Figured he would. Judge Spicer in town? Reckon so. Then I'll talk to him. And you come along to back me up. That's what us taxpayers paying you for. All right. I'll 
see you over there. Yeah, it's the Alhambra. Oh, How's he feel, Narsh? He's making up his mind, Joe. Sit at another table, boys, and labor and go along. Huh? Bartender, bring us a bottle and some glasses. Howdy, boys. Come on over. Hello, Curly. Curly, good to see you. You all the friends I got? Well, some of the bunch taking sides with Johnny. That's their business. Where's Frank and Tom McLowry? They couldn't make it. Tom said him and Frank wish you good luck to Curly. <laughs> they know Ringo. He has funny spells. You know, I saw Ringo shoot Turk Davis because he ordered beer instead of whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> That's Ringo for you. Arkin, bring another chair over. We might as well be comfortable while we're waiting. Joe, bring us all a whiskey. Curly ain't going after Ringo. Ringo's got to come after Curly first. Sure. I don't want the old man blaming me for this. This row's dividing my whole outfit. And if Ringo and Brocious go to shooting, there's going to be a big war on Allen Street. And all that Marshal Earp does is talk. How can he arrest them? I'll say they both rustle some of my steers. Could you prove that? You can hold them on suspicion, can't you? No, sir. In fact, I think you've got an awful lot of cheek to bring your troubles into Tombstone. My last week, you tried to ambush Marshal Earp and Deputy Gibbs. And there's still the killing of that Wells Fargo guard. I see. A taxpayer can't ask a judge and a John Law to do their duty. Well, I'll speak to them around if it's no good. He'll blister your hides for you. You'd think he was a law-abiding citizen. He's got us cornered, and he knows it. Well, sir, I... Uh... I could pick a fight with Johnny Ringo. No. That would just make things worse. You'd have to wound the man or kill him. Yes, sir. Clanton's put us all on trial, Wyatt. People expect us to act with strict legality. Now, couldn't you find some ordinance that Ringo and Curly have broken? I'll try. <laughs> Johnny Ringo! I want to talk to you! Curly wants me to explain something! Come on out, Ringo! It's that blabbermouth Larkin. Go out and see what he's up to. Yes, sir. Right away, Johnny. Where's Ringo? Why didn't he come out himself? He don't talk to blabbermouths like you. Oh, yeah? What'd I blabber about? You said Johnny was running away when his horse got shot. That's a dirty lie. He also said that Curly gave Johnny a stolen horse. Another lie. Oh? So what kind of a horse is Curly riding? You know, you wouldn't be telling lies like that, Irish, if I was carrying my gun. You go get your gun. I'll wait till Curly's taking care of Ringo. Then I'll come after you. It'll be the other way around, Larkin. I'm gonna gun you. Talk's cheap. You wanna hear what Curly has to say or don't you? No, Ringo ain't interested in what that fool says. Next time, you'll be wearing your gun. You ask for it. You tell Ringo to come out and make his play. And I'll be waiting for you. Brocious is waiting at the Alhambra. You'll have to go there after him. All right. Now? In a minute. Get me a drink. Sure, Johnny. Bartender. Whiskey. What was all that about? Gibbons and Larkin got a fight of their own started. Threatened to gun each other. Oh, that's fine. Any particular time? Yeah. After their heroes kill each other. All right. You going over to the jail? Wait for me. I got something I want to do, and I'll join you later. It's almost 4 o'clock. This is beginning to fidget me. 
Oh, uh, stop worrying about the old man, Curly. Go over to the birdcage and finish him, Curly. Ringo probably thinks you're scared. Well, he thinks wrong. Curly! Ringo's coming after you. How do you know? That liar and Iris has been talking. Too much and too big. Good. Then it won't be my fault. <laughs> We can make a case to stop him. Yeah, how's that? Well, Curly's horse has got a mangled brand. Ringo's horse hasn't got a brand at all. They could be stolen. Yeah, they sure could be. Ringo must be ready to go after brochures by now. You going over to the Alhambra and arrest Curly. I'll get Ringo. Right. <laughs> Gun. Right away, Johnny. Yeah. Where were you, Ringo? Uh, Brocious hasn't got the stomach for this. I'll back you, Johnny, in case Larkin does anything wrong. Give me your gun, Ringo. Back up, all of you. Come on, back away. I said, back away. He got Ringo thrown in the jail by blabbing too loud on the street. And I'll fix Larkin. I told him I would. With your mouth or with that 45? I'm gonna gun him down. Looks like he's after you. He threatened to kill me and call me a liar. I got witnesses. You don't need witnesses. Put on your gun belt. He's putting on his gun. That's what you wanted, ain't it, Irish? I can take that slow poke. Hurry it up, Larkin! Brocious and Ringo out here, quick. That's Larkin, Marshal. He's dead, Marshal. Mr. Gibbs, bring our two heroes over here. Stop the car, boy.
Gibbons was a mite faster than Larkin. Caught him in the stomach. At the same time, Larkin caught Gibbons in the chest with a reflex yank in the trigger. They must have gotten off the second shot at the same time after they hit the ground. Both were hit in the head and killed. That's all, gentlemen. Let's go, boys. All right, gentlemen, pay out the money on the no-fight bet, 100 to 1. What about the other bets, Doc? They've all been canceled. Ringo and Brocious didn't fight. Come on, gentlemen, pay up. Uh huh. not yet. Look, Brocious and Ringo can still fight as soon as they get out of jail. He's right, Doc. The bet should stand. How much you want to bet on your own lives? Hold it, Doc. You men get off the street. I say get off the street. I may need your help. Both sides may start shooting again. Not until you turn Ringo and Brocious loose. I want to thank you, Wyatt, for arresting those two. I made the killer. Be act serious for a minute. We'll try and get them out of town. Now? This is a powder keg. I figure if I can get Brocious and Ringo outside the city limits, Clanton Cowboys will go too. You are going to give Ringo and Brocious back their guns? Outside of town. Well, then I'll be very happy to tend to my assistance. I know what you're thinking, and you're wrong. We've had enough gunfighting for one day. Certainly, most certainly. All right, hold it right here. Give back that gun, Mr. Gibson. They still look mean and ornery to me, Why? Got no legal right to withhold their weapons. You're the boss. Maybe you ought to get them down off their horses at least, Why? I got $6,500 bet on this. Hear that, Johnny? Doc's betting on our hides. You ain't so smart, Doc. We ain't fighting just to make you rich. Come on, Curly. Sure thing, Johnny. Too bad. We couldn't have picked a prettier place for him to die. Had a small bet on him myself. Top guns usually live quite a while, Mr. Gibbs. They seldom shoot at their own equals. Let two of our men get killed. Just wait till you read the nugget. Deacon, you live to regret this. I already do. After several attempts to get rid of Marshall Earp had failed, his political enemies decided to go after Shotgun Gibbs, Wyatt's close friend and right-hand man. By killing Shotgun, the 10% ring hoped to sicken Wyatt of his job and drive him out of Tombstone. What took you so long? Shiloh Smith's been waiting an hour. And who is Shiloh Smith? The new boss. We put him in Dan Pretty's place yesterday. Oh. Well, I'll be right in. I think, gentlemen, it would be a wrong move to bushwhack Wyatt Earp just now. He killed Dan Pretty, didn't he? Made it look like suicide. No, Mr. Smith. Wyatt doesn't do things that way. I suspect Doc Holliday. Then let's get Holliday. No good either. Not just now. Why? Well, he has too many hoodlum friends in and around Tombstone. And he's cautious. Too good. All you can say is no, Bean. We've got to settle with Wyatt Earp. He slowed everything down. You talk like Earp's friend. He was in on a pretty killing. Somebody's got to pay for Dan. Gentlemen, I have an idea if you'll listen. All right, let's have it. Wyatt Earp has a chief deputy called Shotgun Gibbs. He's very fond of him. If something were to happen to Gibbs, Wyatt would feel responsible and get discouraged and leave Tombstone. 
Might not be a bad move. Gibbs could be trapped, I think. He's a big leather britches from Wyoming and not too bright. How do you propose to go about it? Gibbs is fond of mules. Rides one called Roscoe. I think our best bet is to use six mule Marcy to get next to Gibbs. Marcy, good. Six mule would bushwhack his own brother for $50. Now, Mr. Smith, you send him into Tombstone, and I'll handle the details, such as selling the idea to Marcy but and But make Amy. it stick. We want no excuses. Gentlemen, I assure you that... All right, all right. That's enough chatter. Now get on your way. Yes, sir. Mr. McGeehan's over to the hotel, eating breakfast. Yeah. Hey, that's sure a good-looking parcel of mules you got here. Uh, thank you, mister. Thank you. Is that your mule? Yes, sir. I'm proud to see you. Well, I can return the compliment. Well, thank you. Uh, what might your name be? Gil. Yeah. What's yours? Marcy. Call me Six Mule Marcy. That's the way it is with a muley man. You kind of get nicknamed. Yeah. <laughs> hey, you must be a new John Law in Tombstone. Well, kind of new. I'm chief deputy to Mr. Wyatt Earth. Oh. Hey, that there mule's collar gall pretty bad, ain't he? Sure is. You know, I doctored that mule with carbolic acid and boric acid powder. And you ever try a beef tallow and balsam of Peru? Never even heard of it. Marcy, them, them acid steams too much for a mule. Now, if you use beef tallow and balsam of Peru, it steams just enough so that the mule knows he's being doctored. But they don't resent it none. <laughs> Say, you're a real muley man. <laughs> well, a mule's worth giving some thought to. I'll tell you, you unhitch him, I'll find the right medicines for him. Well, thank you, Mr. Gibbs. Thank you kindly. I'm going over to the hotel to get some breakfast, Wyatt. Care to join me? No, not right now. Well, you didn't happen to see Shotgun, did you? This hour of the morning, I can't see anything. Why? Well, he had the night patrol, and he hasn't checked in yet. He's probably gone over to make Roscoe's breakfast. That's true love, Wyatt. Have you heard about him lately? Who? Roscoe. He's feeling melancholy. Got Shotgun worried. A mule with melancholia? Well, that's possible. Roscoe has no pride of ancestry and no hope of posterity, as they say. I think Roscoe's just off his feed. You know that mule is Shotgun's biggest weakness? On the contrary, Wyatt. I think that Roscoe is Shotgun's strength. Just like that's my strength. I also think that a certain stubborn, muley courage flows from Roscoe into Shotgun. You have it your way. I'm going to go and try and find him. See you later. Right. There, now, Willie, how do you feel? Better? Sure you do. Listen, Mr. Marcy, you cut yourself a chamois pad for the top of Willie's collar. A couple of days, he'll be cured all right. By Joe, shotgun, I'm going to stand you some drinks. No, there ain't no charge needed. Ain't no charge at all. Good lesson for Roscoe. Mr. Gibbs? Good morning, what? Marshal Earth? I Martin. have the honor back in Dodge. That's right, you're six mule Marcy. You forgot something, did you? Forgot? What's that? Forgot to check in from evening patrol. Well, George, you sure didn't, did I? I was awful worried about my mule. Well, I'll be moseying along. That office still stands, shotgun. Yeah, I'll be seeing you, Marcy. Bartender, another round for everybody. Let's get a game started, Six Mule. Uh, I ain't thinking about cards. Hey, don't you fellows ever have any horse or mule racing here in Tombstone? You can't race in the mountains. Some of the boys over at Charleston and Gaileyville do some racing. Well, that's mighty interesting. Shotgun! Ha! Come on over here. Well, stick around, boys. 
Shotgun may be a John Law, but he's a friend of mine. And what he don't know about mules, nobody knows. Honey, let Mr. Gibbs sit down here. Come on, friend, have a seat. Hey, uh, I got that pad for Willie's collar. Tell me, uh, has Roscoe perked up any? No, he ain't. Steal off a mournful like. Too bad. Joe, I despise to see a mule give up. Oh, you're a fool, Marcy. A mule might bark at a man, but I never heard of one giving up. I had a mare mule named Sadie. She got homesick, just laid down on a trail and died. Oh, Roscoe ain't homesick. He never did care nothing about her old place up in Wyoming, no how. Say, I got an idea. Can that mule of yours run? Can he run? Why, of course he can run. He's the fastest mule you ever seen. Are you game to uh, put him in a race? A race? Oh, I, don't, I don't know about that six mule. He's, a, he's a feeling some miserable. Well, that's just it. Roscoe wins a race, that might be the cure. You know, build up his self-confidence. Well, I don't know. I've seen that. your mule travel. I'll back him up against anything you got, Marcy. Oh, I ain't in it for the betting. Why, it's Roscoe I'm thinking of. Now, what do you say, shotgun? By George, it's worth a try. A real good run might shake up his liver at least. <laughs> I'll tell you what. I'll put two of my best mules in against him. Pretty risky, though. If uh, Roscoe got beat real bad, uh, <laughs> he might feel worse than he does now. Well, Roscoe ain't gonna get beat. Not a chance. I'm betting a hundred on Roscoe. Well, I'll cover that. He fell for it. Good. When's the race? Not certain yet. Tomorrow's his day off. You let me know. Right. Well, it's uh, your life and your responsibility. I just say that it looks like a bushwhacking setup to me. Oh, who'd want to bushwhack Roscoe? He needs this race, why? Now, there you go again. Well, you done said yourself that Roscoe might be remembering he wasn't nothing but a mule. How'd you like to be nothing but a mule? Well, sometimes I wish I were. Oh, no, you don't. Life's been dull for Roscoe, just a packing me around on his back. But this race, now that's exciting. Old Roscoe gets out there and stretches them zebra legs and win. I believe he's going to perk up a bit. Well, what you do on your day off is no business of mine. Well, no, it ain't none of your business, but you say the word, there ain't going to be no race. I can't do that, Mr. Gibbs. I have uh, no proof that Marcy's trying to set you up, and I'd look kind of foolish, wouldn't I, if he turned out to be on the level? Oh, I think he's on level wide. Marcy's a real muley man. Even if he did raise a bunch of cane up there in Dodge City, it's just kind of noise-making, wasn't it? Mm hmm. Well, that's a fur piece from a setting up an ambush. I believe old Six Mule likes me and Roscoe. He understands us. Well, I wish you luck. Thank you, boy. I'll tell you something else, too. I'd, I'd thank you more kindly if, well, if you used to wish old Roscoe a little bit of luck. <laughs> All right. You tell Roscoe I wish him luck also. <laughs> I sure will. Oh, howdy, Doc. Howdy. Well, what'd you find out? Just rumors, Wyatt. But they're all bad. They're racing uphill from contention mine. But all the smart gamblers are betting against Roscoe now. That is bad. Roscoe, he could even overtake a horse in five miles. Everybody in town knows that. You couldn't persuade Shotgun, huh? No. You know why it with Marcy mixed up in this, it's bound to be a setup. That trail goes right through thick brush country. That's bushwhacking country, Wyatt. I guess we ought to set up a patrol, huh? You can try, 
patch that one up. Not going to be easy. on the course. Any rider who strays off the course or tries to take a shortcut is disqualified. Agreed? What's the oh, idea yeah. he's carrying that cannon, Marcy? Better leave the gun. That adds 10 or 12 pounds to you. That's a hefty handicap over five miles. There wasn't no rule said I couldn't carry. I'm a carrying it. Well, it's all right with me. Tote the gun. Nobody said he couldn't. Now, if he wants to. All right. Now, any mule that kicks or bites is out of the race. Are you ready? Yeah. All right. Here we go. I want a ten dollars. I feel like you got your dollar. You just put up your money. All right. On your mark. Get set. That start looked all right, Doc. We'll scout the brush ahead of them up to the three-mile point. You want to wait for them there? No. When they catch up to us, we'll patrol ahead of them to the finish line. Watch the end near there. If they get there. Come on. Hey, Roscoe, we got a pretty good lead. Go off a bit. Dust. Must be getting close. Don't get anxious. We got 500 apiece on a good, clean kill. Won't be too long before they get here. You scout that side. I'll take this one. yourself plumb out of wind. Take them now. Come on, Rusko. Wait. We got a race to win. Let the others get out of sight. Come on, boy. Come on. Get on out of there. Gotta finish this race. Shotgun. Oh, yeah. I just don't understand how we miss seeing him. I do. 
We needed a hundred men for this job. Well, we got these two. We probably didn't hire any others. Look, do me a favor, will you? See if you can find their horses, take the bodies back to town. We'll be back in Tombstone before a shotgun is. I'll tell him what he'll do. I know what I'd do. Yeah, so do I. But who would you do it to? Well, Johnny Behan and Mossy. They had some bets down that shotgun wouldn't finish the race. When he finds out, and he will, he'll kill them both, unless you're fool enough to try and stop him. Thanks. No use killing ourselves now. That big galoot's out of it. You sure they bushwhacked him? You heard down two shots, didn't you? Well, somebody's wrong. Look who's coming. Come on, guys! Come on, guys! Who set that ambush, my young? What ambush? You know what ambush I'm talking about. I got two men dead back there, and I got another big slug just itching to find a target. So one of you better start talking fast. We, we don't know nothing. Except that uh, Marcy and John Bean would bet that you wouldn't finish the race. Oh, Marcy and John Bean, was it? Well, that's good enough for me. Gibbs, I was wondering about the race. I didn't think it'd be over so soon. That ain't all you didn't think either, Marcy. Get out off that horse. Why, sure. Might as well. Say, uh, who won? You haven't said a word. I won because your killers were sorry shots. Take off that gun. What's the matter with you, Gibbs? <laughs> what killers? I don't know what you're talking about. Them fellas you hired to bushwhack me, that's what killers. Take off that gun, Marcy. Why, Shotgun, you know me better than that. I didn't hire nobody to kill you. I just put my mules in against Roscoe. You denying you bet I wouldn't finish this here race? Well, I got a right to bet on my own mules, ain't I? But you didn't bet on your own mules. You bet I wouldn't finish this here race. And there's a mighty difference. I didn't do none of it, Gibbs. Being just said it was a sure thing that you wouldn't finish. I, I should bet on that, that's all. Oh, so it is John Bean, was it? Well, he's next, and I'm going to kill him. But I'm going to whoop you right now. I'm going to teach you a lesson. <laughs> too late. Oh, is the race over? Mm -hmm. Who won? Don't you know? No. I don't know. I'm sorry if it didn't turn out to your liking. Well, it turned out fine. Yeah, just fine. Don't you waste your sympathy on me. You save it for yourself. For myself? Mm -hmm. You're in a lot of trouble, Johnny. What are you getting at? Your bushwhack didn't work. Mr. Gibbs is still alive, but two other men are dead. And if Marcy isn't gone before Mr. Gibbs finds him, he's going to be dead, too. 
What's that got to do with me? Oh, just that this job was real important to the ring. You know, Johnny, there's one thing about dirty politics. There's just no excuse when a man fails to do the job he's supposed to do. I don't know what you mean. I had no job to do. Well, then you got nothing to worry about, have you, Sheriff? Nothing at all. I got two men dead out there. You, you're happy because you won your race, ain't you? Well, I'll tell you one thing. It's a human enough feeling, but it ain't decent. Can you get that arm fixed? There's plenty of time for that. I'm a-heading for Ben. Move out of the way. No need to. I just talked to him. Talk to him? Well, I ain't gonna talk to him. I'm gonna kill him. Oh, don't you just let his friends take care of him? You can get yourself in trouble by shooting him. Shooting's too good for him. I'm gonna go in there and drag him out here and stomp his head in the dirt. Besides, he ain't got no friends. Now, wait a minute, Mr. Gibbs. Now, the way I figure, he's gonna have an awful time explaining to that bunch in Tucson about the fact that you're still alive. When they find out that he isn't as smart as he says he is, well, then they're gonna take care of him in their own way. Well, it's, you know, you're a sure enough genius. Sometimes. Well, Roscoe boy, it looks like we both done one something today. I'm gonna get you an apple right now. Mr. Gibbs, don't you ever learn. Now, you get that arm fixed first. And you can stuff Roscoe with the apples as far as I'm concerned. Well, you ain't got no regard for my mule at all. In, sir. What can I do for you? Marshal Wyatt, there's a man in town I think you should know about. Probably a lot of men that I should know about. Which one do you mean? He came in today. His name's Dobie Jenner. Dobie Jenner. Jenner. Sorry, it doesn't mean anything to me. I'm sure he's wanted by the law. Most probably for breaking out of Yuma prison. So maybe you have some information that I don't have. Sit down, sir. Oh, when did he, uh, when did he break out of prison? I don't know that. Well, it must have been quite recent. I'm not positive he did break out, but he must have. He, he was sentenced to five years, and it's hardly four. And I saw him here in Tombstone today. Oh. Then you knew him well? Very well. He was my mining partner before I went into the mercantile business. And now you're turning him in? Marshal, he's a murderer. That's why he was sent to prison. Well, they usually hang murderers, Mr. McKean. The important thing, he's here in town. Now, what are you going to do about it? Mr. McKean, he could have been released early on good behavior. He may have as much right in this town as you or I. I tell you, he's dangerous. Run him out before he causes trouble. For whom? Does he bear a grudge 
Against you, maybe, for uh, putting him in prison? No, not that. It's... It's Phoebe, Mrs. McKean. She was... That is... Jenner thought she intended marrying him, and I suppose he thought she'd wait for him. I see. Has he made any threats? No, but... I know him. He's a violent man. He's proved that. And what's the reason he's here? Well, there could be lots of reasons why he's here. No. This happened in Prescott. Now, if he's been there and found out we're married, we're in awful danger. I demand you do something about it. I said I would check on him. That's not enough. You've got to run him out of town. Mr. McKean, I can't run him out of town unless he gives me a reason. Now, you stay away from him, and maybe he'll stay away from you, sir. Marshal, you're going to be sorry for this. Hello, Wyatt. Hello, Miss Nellie. So, do you have a man registered here by the name of uh, Jenner? Sure have. Room 14, upstairs. What's the matter? Nothing, really. He's just kind of a strange person. Did you know he made us put his bed on the porch outside his window? <laughs> What do you want? My name's Wyatt Earp. I see you're a marshal, too. I, uh... kind of figured you'd come snooping around. I got a legal right to be here. This paper says so. You're right. According to this, you've uh, been on parole for a month. Where you been? Prescott. Why'd you come to Tombstone? I gotta have a reason. Most men do. <laughs> so McKean came running to you like a scared rabbit, huh? You bear him any grudge? Supposing I do. Maybe I got that right, too. Maybe. Marshal, I'm a miner. Or was. Mining played out around Prescott, so I came here. Now, does that answer your question? Not entirely. I'm looking for a new start if you John Laws will let me get it. Well, you'll get it for me, as long as you don't violate your parole. And what will you call a violation? Any act of violence against Mr. McKean, or his wife. Phoebe? Now, why would I want to harm her? Because she married McKean instead of you. Man can't blame a woman for that. Especially when he goes and gets himself sent off to a prison. No. Mr. Jenner, could you tell me what happened? I killed a man. A miner. Robbed him, he fought me, and I killed him. And why didn't they hang you? I'd never done anything bad before. Miner was drunk, he fought me like a wild man. I had to kill him in self-defense. Oh, I was... I was wrong, but I paid. I paid dearly, four long years. So you tell McKean to relax. I'll let bygones be bygones. You see that he does the same. All right. Say, by the way, uh, how come you insist in staying out here? You ever see the inside of Yuma prison? I'm sure you have. I can't sleep cooped up in a room anymore. Marshal. How is she? Phoebe, I mean. How does she look? She looks fine. Maybe it was best then. He's still there. 
Oh, George, why don't you go out and talk to him? I told you, he'll kill me. Oh, you can't believe that of Dobie. Well, I can. I think he only wants to talk to us. He's standing out there afraid to come in, uh, ashamed. Uh, Phoebe, I don't understand you. Well, I don't understand you. You were friends, partners. Why should you fear him now? Well, prison changes a man. You didn't see his face, his eyes. Well, he's been through a lot. And he needs our help. At least you can talk to him. Not me. George, if you won't go out to him, I will. Phoebe, I forbid it. Forbid it? <laughs> Dobie, I know you're there. Please, I want to talk to you. Hello, Dobie. Hello, Phoebe. You look thin. Was it awfully bad? Oh, no, no. It wasn't really bad. Well, it's over now. Oh, Doby, why don't you come in? You know my house is open to you anytime. No, no, I uh, just came over to speak to George, really. Now, Doby, it's as much my blame as his. Oh, no, no, there's, there's no blame. No one's to blame. That's what I wanted to tell George. It isn't as if you'd promised or anything. But I might have. I cried for a long time after they sent you away. I, I didn't marry George right away. You have a better life now. Nice house. Yes, it's not like the dance-off. George has prospered in Tombstone. I'm glad. Well, goodbye, Phoebe. Dobie, what are you going to do? Oh, I haven't made up my mind yet. Well, let us help you. You and George were partners once. Uh, things have changed, Phoebe. Things have changed. Bye, Phoebe. Phoebe, are you happy? Of course. Goodbye. Janet, get away from my wife and stay away. George, put down that gun. Did you hear me, Janet? Get out of town and stay out. George, what are you saying? He's our friend. He means us no harm. That's what you think. Well, I don't. He hates us. Hates me, anyway. And the feeling's mutual. Scum, that's all he is. A jailbird and a murderer. George! And if he doesn't leave us alone, I'll see he goes back to prison where he belongs. Jenner! You won't need that gun, Mr. McKean. Put it down. All right, Marshal. But you've seen yourself he was waiting to attack me. You're lying! I said I'd handle this. Mr. McKean, you go on inside the house. You too, Mrs. McKean. Marsha, my husband's mistaken. Mr. Jenner meant us no harm. He's welcome in my house anytime. Phoebe, what are you saying? Exactly what I mean. If I catch him around here, he's a dead man. And the law will back me up. You coming in? Don't worry, Mrs. McKean. I understand. Bye, Dobie. Marshal, I think I'll get myself some prospecting equipment and leave town tomorrow the next day. 
That's probably best for everybody. I had to see her just once. Well, I understand that. One thing I can't understand, Mr. Jenner, is the king was trying to bait you. He was hoping for a chance to use that gun. Why? I told you I'd let bygones be bygones. I will, as long as she's happy. said about oh, three or four weeks ago. Jenner? Yeah, what about him? I heard the darn fools up in Dry Canyon prospecting. <laughs> sure must be a sorry miner. Anybody in Arizona territory can tell him ain't no more gold up there. Wyatt! Wyatt, come over to the hotel quick. What's the matter, Miss It's Sally? Mrs. McKean. She wants to talk to you. George McKean. You're not fooling me. You left me so you could go to Dobie. That's not true. Why do you keep saying it? You can't do this to me. I'll kill him. And the law won't stop me. No jury will convict me for killing the scum who broke up my home. This isn't really any of my business, you know. Oh, no, but it is, Marshal. Well, you heard him. George is going to kill Dobie. You've got to stop him. I can't just arrest your husband because he made threats. Yes, but you can warn Dobie. Do you know where he is? Oh, no, I haven't seen him since that night. Uh, Dobie's coming here, brought things to a head, but... The marriage was a mistake from the beginning. There's no understanding between Dobie and me, whatever my husband said. But Dobie did go to jail because of me. Because of you? He never tried to steal except... except to get money to buy me things. You see, I was a dance hall girl, and I thought I had to have expensive things. I see. Mrs. McKean, when you married your husband, uh, he had enough money to start a business. Where'd you get it? He told me he sold a mining claim. Why? Oh, I just wanted to know. Well, I'll see if I can find Jenna before your husband does.
Over here, Dobie. Get away, it's me, Wider. What are you doing out here, Marshal? Just came to call? Oh. Uh, sit down. Care for a little warmed over coffee? Oh, thank you. You're uh, not working those diggings over there, are you? Oh, no, no. I'm working up above where there's water. Getting any? Oh, not enough to make it pay, I'd say. I'm not making any big fortune. What you doing it for? Oh, it's better out here in the fresh air and sunlight. Working in a store someplace. Jenna, this is Apache country. Solitary man in these canyons, well, it isn't safe. Nobody would care whether the Apaches got me or not. Well, if you're uh, working up high because of the water, how come you're not camping up there? It's too closed in up there. I like it down here and where it's open and fresh air. Well, maybe you have another reason. Maybe you're thinking of using that uh, shaft as a trap. You found that, huh? Mm-hmm. Oh, it's just a little something I fixed up in case anybody came snooping around. Particularly one man, McKean. It's no secret I'm here. Thought maybe he might get a little curious. And if he didn't find out that you were here, you were going to make sure he did. I think you've got the wrong idea about me, Marshal. I don't want to kill McKean. I'd just like to give him a little taste of what it feels like be in Yuma prison. Mr. Jenner, I came out here to ask you a question, to give you a message. Go ahead. The question is, what happened to that money you stole from the miner? They never found it. You swore that you didn't get it. But I think you know who did. It was McKean, wasn't it? He was your partner, and he was in on the whole thing, wasn't he? No answer. I had my day in court. I don't have to answer that question. Well, maybe you'll change your mind when I give you the message. Mrs. McKean left her husband, moved into a hotel. She asked me to warn you that her husband blames you for her leaving. He wants to kill you. Now, you want to answer my question? She left him. She's not happy with it? Never was. All right. You were right all along. McKean planned the whole thing right from the beginning. He did the robbing. Then when the miner showed up, I stayed and did the fighting while he got away. Why didn't you say that in court? We're partners. I figured that Half of the money would be waiting for me when I got out. When I did, I knew I couldn't get close to it. I see. And you paid your debt, and he hasn't. You could never prove anything against him. Maybe we can. Maybe we can with the use of that trap of yours. <laughs>
You're looking for me, George? General, I'll be out of here. No, I don't know about that. You trap me. This is a trap. Only if somebody comes snooping around. I... I, I was just looking for you, Dobie. To shoot me or... Give me back my half of the money. Step out so I can see you. To shoot me, maybe. But if you did that, you might never get out of there, George. You better do some thinking about that. Dobie, let me out, please. No, George. I think you better stay there for a while. Get some idea of how I felt there in Yuma Prison. Nights. Like this, when you're lonely and afraid. The hot days. Days so hot you can hardly breathe and it feels like it's baking you alive. I think you better stay there for a while. Wait till you go through one of those days. Don't be let me out of here, please. You didn't say about my half of the money. I'll give it to you. I always meant to. There wasn't much, Dobie. The fellow didn't have very much. He had enough to put you in business. I'll give you half of everything. You can't give me back those years in prison. Dobie, please. You knew that miner was coming back, didn't you? No. No, I didn't. I swear it. I planned everything very carefully. And if you'd only followed orders, there wouldn't have been any trouble. Now let me out of here, Dobie. Let me out. Throw out your gun. Now, you Hold scum! It. He heard the whole thing, George. Give me your bandana. George Goodfellow was a Civil War surgeon and a leading citizen of Tombstone. Unfortunately for Wyatt, the doctor was a man of medicine first and a law enforcer second. Although his code and Wyatt seldom clashed, there was one time when they did. Doctor? Tinkham Brown and his men are wanted for a mail robbery. You know him? Yes, I know him. He ever been a patient of yours? Oh, probably. Now, take him or one of his men were hit during the holdup of that stage. Now, if the man was hurt bad enough, he may send for him. I'm the only surgeon within 50 miles. He probably will. Hmm. I don't suppose that uh, if he does send for you, that you'd tell me about it, would you? Wyatt, well, you know medical ethics? You know that I honor them. Wouldn't be alive if I didn't. That's beside the point. The day may come when a doctor is forced to reveal information about his patients, but my code forbids it now. I know that. But my code has rules, too. Now, if they do send for you, I'm going to have to trail you. You're an officer of the law. That's your duty. My duty is to help sick people. Tinkham Brown's got a pretty rough bunch of boys. He may think that you told me to follow you. Wyatt, it's late. I want to finish these case histories. Would you mind clearing out? All right. You uh, realize that you could be killed? I lived through the Civil War. Could have been killed in a dozen battles. And 50 times since.
Doc's coming, boss. Anyone on his trail? Just him and Swanee. I knew I could trust the Doc. Talk right up, Doc. The bullet went through your chest, lodged against your spine. All right. Take it out. I'm not that good a surgeon. You're the best they is, Doc. Nah, just talk. What do you know about surgery? From the paralysis in your legs, I'd say that the bullet's pressing on the spinal cord. If I go in there, one slip of the knife could kill you. Then there'd be a slip of the trigger, Doc. Put that thing away. Doc's my friend, Swanee. You know I got no choice, Doc. Man might as well be dead as paralyzed. Well, I've told you part of the truth. Now I'm gonna tell you the rest of it. Wyatt Earp talked to me about you last night. I think he's followed me here. That John Law. That's all right, boss. We'll take care of him. You'll do nothing of the kind. Now, just a minute. I'm gonna need Earp for this. If he's brought Holiday, I can use him, too. The operating? They wouldn't help me, Doc. And they ain't gonna arrest us. It's your only hope. Well, it's my job to, to save your life. Earp doesn't want you dead. You'd be no use to him that way. Now, do you want me to talk to him? Or do you want to finish up like a dog with a broken back? You mean this one's on the house? No shooting on either side? That's what I mean. All right. See what you can do, Doc. You boys do what he tells you. Until Dr. Goodfellow leaves. I don't want him catching a bullet for his trouble. Maybe they done already killed Goodfellow. Serve him right if they had. It's foolish that he'd have such a regard for Hoolam's life. I always figured him to be a coal man. I've uh, heard people say that you're the one that's heartless, Doc. I am. That ain't the way them Texas folks tell it. They tell me you rode a hundred miles once to operate on a man's jawbone. I was to win a bet. Man had such a bad necrosis, and the local MD backed out, and the bets were so high that somebody's coming. That's the doctor. Hello, I. Are you steady? Pull out your hand. My hand's as steady as yours. Did your patient die? No. But it's a difficult situation. I have to explain. Brown's agreed to a truce. The bullet slides against the spine, but there may be a chance with Holiday to hold retractors and you, Wyatt, to manage the ether. Well, we better get on up there. Doctor? Yeah? What happens afterward? Oh, they go on to a new camp and you start hunting them again. We ought to take them right now. Nonsense. Brown's in bad shape. You passing out the death sentence for mail robbery these days, Wyatt? No, sir. What do you think, Doc? The operation sounds interesting. But you better not let Wells Fargo know you agreed to anything like this. Gentlemen, every minute counts. Walk along with me, Holiday, so I can explain what I'm going to do. Come on.
There's the bullet. Yes. How's the pulse? Pretty good. Well, we'll pull the slug. Here's a clean sponge, Holiday. Be ready with the clamp. There it is. Is he gonna make it, Doc? Can't tell for a couple of days. Keep him right where he is. Give him laudanum to keep him quiet. And if he starts fever, send for me. What about Eric? The marshal agreed to a truce. He'll keep it. That's right. For how long? Until Dr. Goodfellas says he can travel. And if you boys don't come into Tombstone, I'm gonna come after you again. You'll come in if you got any sense. Oh, quit the gab. Mr. Brown is my patient. After he recovers or dies, I have no further interest in the matter. It's up to him to decide, if he lives, whether or not he wants to remain a fugitive. You did a pretty good job, Holiday. I wish they'd let us take him up to the hospital so you can keep your eye on it. Oh, no. No, you Johnny Laws are gonna push along. Holster that gun. I said I don't want him moved at all, not even to the hospital. I don't expect you to thank Marshal Earp for what he's done. But if there's any more of this behavior, I'll not see Brown again. Long riot. There you are, Doc. Thanks, Wyatt. Will Brown make it? Well, he has a chance. Wells Fargo says that he got away with fifteen thousand dollars in that mail robbery. Probably. Good surgical problem. I learned quite a bit. Sir, quite a bit. See you later, Wyatt. Wyatt, they ain't gonna stick with Tinkum. If it was me, I'd go back and get some more boys, come up here and smoke them out. I can't do that. Not yet. Gibbs, you got the soul of a bloodhound. While surgical history is being made, all you can think of is capturing those mail robbers. Hey, Doc. Is that operation that unusual? Hmm. This good fellow's a genius. Well, that bullet was impinged on his spinal column with bone splinters all around. If Brown lives, Johns Hopkins should publish a paper on it. Huh. Well, a lot of good that'll do with why I'm trying to explain this here to Wells Fargo. Let's stop jawing about it. Get back to town. Tinkum Brown was wounded. The gang sent for Dr. Goodfellow. Didn't you tail him? Yes, sir, we tailed him. Doctor had to operate in order to save his life. Why didn't you pick up the others? Because Dr. Goodfellow pledged us to a truce. He had to help with the surgery. A truce with mail robbers? Oh, now, Wyatt. I'll round up a posse. Now, wait a minute, Mr. Thacker. This is a personal thing with me. Dr. Goodfellow told me how bad Brown was hit, I... Well, I just couldn't sentence a man to death. I'm not the judge and jury, you know. All right, Wyatt. But we've got the job to finish. Just tell me where Brown is. We'll pick him up. I can't do that either. Why not? Because Dr. Goodfellow's a friend of mine. Brown is his patient. Well, the way the doctor sees it, I had to trail him. You know, that was my job. But I'd be violating his medical ethics if I sent a posse out there after Brown before he was well enough to travel. Medical ethics? Take him, Brown, as a hoodlum. Do you realize what San Francisco would do if I sent this report in? Look, I don't belong to Wells Fargo. You're a deputy United States Marshal. It was your duty. Then I'll get Brown and his men, I promise you that. When? As soon as Dr. Goodfellow discharges him. A week or so. Does Dr. Goodfellow realize that he's risking his life fooling around with a bunch of outlaws? Yeah, he realizes it. 
He takes a chance in his life every time he goes out on the trail to help a sick cowboy. Are you keeping a guard on him? Day and night. All right, Wyatt. I won't report to San Francisco yet. Thank you. I'll uh, see if I can get a bulletin from Doc. See you later. Feeling, boss? Rocky. Well, I can move my legs a little. Doc, good fella says you should lay still. Herp and his crowd, are you sure they left? Swanee tail him halfway back to Tombstone. I don't trust Herp. We gotta move from here, deeper into the mountain. Sure, in three days, Doc said. Not three days, tonight. Doc said three days if you ain't got no fever. It ain't Doc's business. You pack me on a horse stretcher and we'll go. Hey, Swanee. Come over here and talk some sense to the boss. He wants to move. You must be out of your mind, Tinkum. That bullet almost broke your backbone. I saw it. Doc taking a bullet out, didn't he? Yes, but... Quit arguing. I know how I feel. And I don't aim to spend ten years in federal prison. All right, you take it easy. I'll ride into town if the doc says it's all right. No, we're moving at sundown. I got a hunch, boys. I smell Wyatt Earp and a posse. Well, it's your backbone. You can take it, I guess we can. What? One of them Tinkum Brown men just come for Doc Goodfellow. Has the Doc left yet? No, he's still got some patients to see. Where's the Tinkum man? Sitting on the front porch. All right, I'll try and sneak around the back way and we'll talk with Dr. Goodfellow. Evening, Doctor. Well, you have quite a spy system. Mr. Gibbs said that he saw one of the Tinkham Brown boys out front. Brown started the fever, I'll have to go. What if he dies? They'll blame you for it. No, I've been blamed before. A real bad bunch, Doctor. I'm not interested in their morals. Brown's feverish, post-surgical. If his name was Smith, I'd still go. No, I don't like it. I'm sorry, Doctor, but I'll have to trail you again. That could really get me in trouble, you know. Doctor, I played it your way this morning. Brown had his chance. If something does go wrong, you'll be much safer if you have guns covered. I will consider it unwarranted interference. Just the same, you may need help. We'll try to be there. It's his idea, Doc. The man disobeyed my orders. I'm off the case. No, oh, yes. Throw that gun away. You won't need it. Brown's a fool. Didn't you tell him he wasn't to be moved? Yeah, but he's the boss. In a matter of medicine, I'm the boss. Doctor's orders are to be followed absolutely. Be sure on, Doc. We got quite a ride up the mountain. Move. Tinkum? If they did, he's dead or dying. Well, there's one way to find out. Come on. Dr. Goodfellow's gun. I'll be 
be daylight. Soon we'll trail them. Yeah. My legs feel numb, Doc. Well, why shouldn't they? I left strict orders you weren't to be moved. I had to. I was scared of her, Doc. You don't trust anyone. Here, swallow some of this. What is it? Whiskey. Now drink it. You reckon Tinkham's gonna make it? I don't know. Both his legs are paralyzed. Where's the money? He's laying on it. I'm gonna find out how bad he really is. Looks like they circle around those rocks. One up there. Yeah. Cave country, what? Sometimes there's a back way in. Let's tie off. Bring that canteen. say that. I have you live for another 30 years. You ducks. You always play it close. <coughs> but that numb feeling, it's come up higher. No, 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 don't try to talk. I'm going to pinch your belly if you feel it nod. You tell the boys he ain't gonna pull through. We're getting out. Doc, my gun. Take it. I'm laying on the money, Doc. Pay yourself off. Thank you, no. Look, Doc, we know he ain't gonna make it. Now you stand back. Leave him alone! He broke his spinal cord trying to get at the money. Where do you keep this money hidden? He was lying on it. Now, come on, Holiday. More work to do. What do you mean, work? Well, you didn't kill them all, did you? Bring the kit, will you, Holiday? All right. There. That should do it for now. Interesting gunshot wounds, all of them. I don't suppose you'd be willing to let nature take its course, would you, Doctor? No, Holiday, I wouldn't. Wyatt, send in a tombstone for a wagon. I'll do my surgery at the hospital. All right, sir. I'll send us to Gibbs. I couldn't save Brown. He wouldn't obey orders. All that jarring around when they moved him. But I think I can save the one I had to shoot. What for? So they can serve 10 years in prison? No, Holiday, for what I can learn. Now, there's another challenging case. 45 slug through the left lumbar. I managed to plug the points of entrance and exit just in time. Dr. Goodfellow? Yeah? Mr. Thacker thinks we ought to go after those two men that got away. I can't spare Gibbs. Can't spare? 
Wyatt, I've got four patients in need of surgery. What are two escaped hoodlums compared to getting these men hospitalized as soon as possible? Their lives ought to be your concern, and Thacker's too. All right, I'll send Mr. Gibbs in after the wagon. Well, Doc, you better stay here in case Dr. Goodfellow needs you. You look like you can use some rest. Yes, Wyatt. I'm a mite tired. A mite tired. A marshal. Yes, sir. I suppose you think I handled the whole affair badly. No, sir, you did your job and I did mine. Next time, don't you count on help coming in the nick of time. I just may be on the wrong side of the mountain. But you do see my position, don't you? Dr. Goodfellow, nobody understands a surgeon except another surgeon. All the hoodlums dead and wounded aren't worth the life that you risked. But you'll go on risking it. I wish you luck. Ah, oh, me, that ain't no way to talk, oh, honey. Oh. I just want to buy you a little drink. Oh, no. Now start, you fool. to be a cashier, but I'm not going in there. Not ever. All right, you wait outside here. Pick him up, Willie. I'm sorry about this, Marshal. I warned everybody to keep the customers away from her. It won't happen again, Miss Silver. Please, I don't want to work for him. All right. If this happens again, you're closed. Why, the kid's just scared. She promised to stay at least a month. You heard her, Mr. Hanson. She doesn't want to work for you anymore. Take you over to Nellie Cashman's. Oh. Help Miss Nellie steal my best cashier, huh? Don't press your luck. You may have to buy some new teeth. <laughs> Often remarked that he was implacable when he faced bad men, but much too soft and trusting when it came to women. Alas, the saga of a young lady known as Silver Dollar presented the mystery which numerous men before Wyatt had failed to solve. Was Silver Dollar an innocent child adrift in Tombstone, or was she a calculating and dangerous little hussy? That was awful brave. I'm scared of Mr. Henson. I guess I'm scared of everybody. How old are you? Twenty. Almost. What's your name? They call me Silver Dollar. That's a strange name. What are you doing here in Tombstone? Oh, it sounded interesting. And they told me in Kansas City there were plenty of jobs here. They did, huh? What's your name? Wyatt Earp. Are you an experienced officer? Somewhat, yes. That man who's bothering me has friends. What if they had tried to shoot you? I usually manage to talk them out of it. Is that a very practical attitude? You could be severely injured, Mr. Earp. Now, don't you worry about me. It's my job to worry about you. Really? No one's ever worried about me in my whole life before. Well, everything's all right, I guess. Anyway, I put her to work helping Mr. Perkins in the office. Marshal Earp wants to know what I think of his charge, huh? Oh, all right, yes. <laughs> well, Silver Dollar's not much of a name to go on. Well, she's probably a runaway from someplace back east. She wouldn't even talk to you? Not yet. Well, she, uh, she seems like a very nice girl. Mm-hmm. Let's hope so. But why, I wouldn't do too much vouching for her, not yet. She's out of the Alhambra, and that's enough for now, isn't it? Of course it is. Thank you very much, Miss Nellie. Excuse me. Oh, he's all yours, Silver. I'll see you later, White. She's awful sweet. Well, she's the best we got. Well, I uh, better get back to work. Wait. 
Won't we be seeing each other sometime? Miss Silver, I live right here at the hotel, and I am not blind. I'll see you. Where's Wyatt? He's busy rescuing an innocent, odd-looking girl from the cashier's cage at the Alhambra. The lady known as Silver Dollar. You talking about that new one with the eyes like a heifer calf? Precisely. Oh. This could be love at first sight, Doc. I don't know what it is, but I do know it means trouble. Yeah. He already beat up a cattleman and threatened to knock out Dave Henson's teeth. That girl's a big asset to Dave. She's so innocent looking that all the customers want to marry her. Dad blasted. You know what she's done? She's done caught wide on the first bounce from Miss Nellie. Oh, you don't approve? No, I don't approve at all. Me or Roscoe, either one don't approve. A shotgun, Doc. I want to send a telegram. Pickerton Detectives, Kansas City. It's about a girl that calls herself Silver Dollar. Tell him to get this off as soon as possible. I sure will. Well, Doc, we was wrong. It ain't love. Hmm. Now, can't I ever help a runaway girl without somebody accusing me of falling in love with her? Well, uh, Miss Silver's run away from something or somebody. Now, we well, we might be able to help her out. Sounds reasonable. I think I'll have another talk with her tonight. I can read the headlines in the nugget right now. Wyatt Earp shot while chatting with pretty female. Not a bad way to go, Wyatt. Excuse me, Mr. Henson? Yeah, what is it? My name's Rafe Collins, and I'm looking for a young lady who goes by the name of Silver Dollar. Why? Well, it's a personal matter. Well, I've never heard of any girl with a nickname like that around here. The town isn't big. Look around. Thanks, I will. Forgive me for using your time. Yeah. Send Charlie to the Cashman Hotel. Have him get word to Silver Dollar. There's a young fellow from the country named Collins looking for her. for a constitutional? I mean, this night air is too healthy for you. All right, you talk. Well, uh, Doc says that, that Henson says that that there girl packs a uh, 41 Derringer. Well, that's nonsense. She doesn't know a Derringer from a horse pistol. She's just a poor, distracted kid. Well, she even thinks she'd be happy married to me. this happened? When I opened the door, he was already here. He grabbed me. I pushed him away and got the gun from that drawer. He reached for me again. 
And I shot him. He's not hurt too bad, Wyatt. No. Take him down to the parlor. Send for Dr. Goodfellow. What happened? It's that young farmer. Is he dead? No, Miss No, he's not hit bad. Oh, do you know who did it? Silver, he told me that you were engaged to marry him. Why did you do this? To protect myself, that's why. I'm sorry, but I don't believe that. No, Miss Nellie, don't be hasty. Get out of here. Both of you. Believe me or call me a liar. But just get out. Get out! Wyatt, I think you better listen to what that young man has to say. Gave her fifteen hundred dollars to pay off her debts and buy clothes for the wedding. And then she up and ran out on me. What happened tonight? Well, I waited for her here at the hotel. Then I followed her upstairs. All I wanted was to ask her to marry me like she promised. In spite of the fact that she ran out on you once? Oh, yes, sir. I loved her. Were you rough on her? Oh, no, sir. She asked me to leave, and when I wanted to argue, she... she just up and shot me. <coughs> Here's a splendid rib. Talk to him tomorrow, will you? All right. Just a busted rib, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. We'll arrest her for you, Wyatt. No, I'll arrest her. You go tell Mr. Hanson. He'll probably want to put up bail. Going to arrest me? Well, don't you think you ought to be arrested? Oh. Not if Rafe wasn't hurt off the bat. Candy? Well, what if he'd have been killed? Will I have to stand trial, too? Of course. Assault with a deadly weapon, at least. I don't suppose you'd run off with me to Denver. No. Put on your coat. That's a silly waste of time. No jury's going to convict me. Besides, it's a measly $1,500. Don't you know there's a law against stealing money? I didn't steal it. Rafe gave it to me. A lot of men have given me money. And you don't see anything wrong in that. Why should I? Men have a lot more money than girls do. And if they want to give me some of it, what's wrong with that? They're not giving. They're buying you. Buying me? Nobody does that. Oh, they may think so. I can't stop them from thinking. When this is all over, don't you want to marry me? Miss Silver, I might want to, but I wouldn't. Why not? Well, I'm too cautious. All right. We're not even friendly. You can arrest me this time. But next time, I'll have to shoot you. Why don't you do that? Let's go on to the jail. Hmm? When you found Mr. Collins in your room, Miss Silver, what happened next? Do I have to tell that? You're testifying in your own defense, Miss Silver. The court must advise you to answer. 
Well, Rafe grabbed me. And he wouldn't let loose. I broke away from him and back towards the bureau where I kept my gun. And then... Proceed, Miss Silver. He kept after me. I told him to leave or I'd shoot. He reached out to grab me and he said... Well, he said some terrible things. The next thing I knew, he was lying on the floor. And I had the gun in my hand. Are there any further questions? Your Honor? Yes, Mr. Foreman. We've heard enough. We vote unanimously. Not guilty. Case dismissed. You might as well go ahead and make your move, Doc. I ain't taking my eyes off of you. Any answer from the Pinkertons? No, sir, nary a thing. I just come from the telegraph office. Did Silver get a gun back? Yeah. Judge Spicer released it to her. I took her cartridges, though. She can buy them all. Yeah, I know it. I'm going over to Spangenberg's gun shop pretty soon. Don't waste your time, Wyatt. That woman is a man killer. I'm afraid she is. She said that she was going to shoot me if I tried to arrest her again. Oh, she wouldn't do nothing like that. Well, I'm not going to take the chance. She went back to work at the Alhambra. Henson doubled her wages. That won't be enough. Takes a lot of gold to take the tarnish off a silver dollar. She starts any trouble, Gibbs and I will arrest her. No. I've got to find out. There's a box of 41 dummies here someplace. Right here in this drawer. Will. Can you trust Spangenberg to sell her the blank cartridges? Well, I can trust him, but I don't know if Silver's going to fall for it. You tell the uh, telegraph agent to repeat that query to the Pinkertons. Tell them that a prompt reply is urgent. Yes, sir. What do you think, Doc? I think that Deacon Earp is a lot closer to his grave than he's willing to admit. That girl took my wallet. I had it right here. And after I danced with her and had a few drinks, it was gone. Are you accusing Silver Dollar? Yes, I am. You hear that, boys? He says Silver stole his wallet. All right, Willie. Oh. Seems to be the trouble. A girl stole my wallet. I had close to 5,000 in it. Silver dollar? Here. Yeah. Where's that room? None of your business, sir. I you once before. Now let's go take a look at her room. to make a search. Mr. Clark? Is this yours? Yes, sir. It sure is, Marshal. Well, this don't prove nothing. You're just sore at her because she wouldn't marry you. Maybe you're even trying to frame her. You keep on talking. You're going to lose some teeth yet. Count the money. 
What are you doing here? This is my room. You stole this man's money. That? I never saw it before. Er planted it here, honey. You two gentlemen leave. I'd like to talk to Miss Silver alone. What's the idea? I just want to give you another chance to tell the truth. I don't need another chance. I'm doing all right. Don't you realize that stealing that much money is a felony? That you could go to jail for a long time? You have to arrest me first. Do you remember what I told you? Yeah, you said you'd shoot me. Get out. No. I'll count to four. One, two, Three, four. Oh. I wouldn't have believed it up until now. The world's full of men. Am I to understand, Mr. Clark, that you gave the wallet to Miss Silver? Yes, sir. That's right. What do you say, Marshal? Well, it still doesn't change the fact that she tried to shoot me with that Derringer. Miss Silver? The gun was loaded with dummy shells. I bought them from Mr. Spangenberg, and I think Mr. Earp told him to sell them to me. So you see, it was just one big joke. Marshal, did you plant those cartridges? Yes, sir. Then she can't be accused of assaulting you with a deadly weapon. Mr. Clark, you and Miss Silver may go. Thank you, Judge. Allow me, my dear. Well, of course, he changed his story. But if the Derringer had had live bullets in it, you might have been killed. Yes, sir. And you can bet that the next time she'll use real cartridges. Well, I don't know what to do. I uh, can't run, and I sure can't have a shootout with a girl. Just can't understand how a sweet little thing like that could... Uh, Marshal, I'm going to issue an order to you and your deputies. Now, you stay away from Miss Silver. And keep alive. You understand? Yes, sir. You grab Sonny Boy, and I'll take Silver Dollar. We'll cut through the alley. You'll feel better when you've made up your mind. Oh, will I? Yeah. Make it up now. Say you'll marry me. I've always dreamed of living in Denver or San Francisco. <laughs> yeah, good places to visit, hon, but San Antone's right lively. Oh, 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 what is this? Turn me loose. Carrying a concealed weapon. How naughty of you. I'm surprised, Silver Dollar. Real life cartridges, too. This is outrageous. I'll vouch for her. Vouching for her won't be enough, Sonny. You'll have to get a lawyer. I'll get one. The best in town. Silver? We nailed her, Wyatt. She was carrying this. A $50 fine, isn't it? I'm sorry, Miss Silver, but it won't be quite that easy. You're wanted in Missouri, armed robbery, a Casey gang. No jury is going to convict me. You found that out once. Lock her up, Mr. Gibbs. You're just wasting a lot of time. Mr. Jack Ramey and his lawyer will have me out in five minutes. Come along, Miss. You know, I think I'll marry Jack. He's a nice, rich boy. Armed robbery. The Pinkertons haven't done justice to our girl. It's a horrible photo. And what's this? Silver Dollar's real name is Bridget Casey? The lawyer's coming. Where's Miss Silver? She's in a cell. 
being held on a Pinkerton charge of armed robbery. Well, that's a filthy lie. You're not going to torment her. I know what happens. I'll wait for her. By gad, I'm afraid he will. Maybe she'll change, Doc. Oh, that does it. I'm going over to the birdcage, where I can get away from all the fool men in this world. Well, he cleaned up the country, the old Wild West country. He made law and order prevail. And none can deny it, the legend of Wyatt forever will live on the trail. Oh, Wyatt Earp, Wyatt Earp, brave, courageous, and bold. Long live his fame, and long live his glory, and long may his story be told. 